In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, good morning again. Good morning. I was really glad to be invited by Joe Tinley to come back um, to St. Albans today. Even though I have not been here with you, I continue to pray for the success of this church. It is great to be back and to see so many familiar faces. No matter what church I serve in, this will be the only church that I ever call home. We have had a whole series of difficult parables these last few Sundays. And now today we have this startling story of murder and mayhem. There is no mistaking this story for anything but a parable. Sometimes we confuse parables with example stories that have a perfectly obvious lesson and a moral printed in black and white at the end. Stories that are clearly intended to teach and do that clearly, such as Aesop's fables. But parables are different. Jesus said a couple of times that he told them to confuse people, even to conceal the secrets of the kingdom of God. They are puzzling, strange, courageous, and maybe offensive. The stories that Jesus told did not give anyone simple answers, and they did not make a lot of friends for him either. Often they made people mad, eventually so mad they killed him. In a parable, the parts of the story do not lead to a simple conclusion. Instead, they lead us into a world where things are not as we expect. They proceed by reversals. The minute we think we have it, there is an unexpected turn, and we have to think again. Parables work on us and in us to challenge and change us. Let me repeat. Parables work on us and in us to challenge and change us. Jesus begins this parable by telling us a rich landowner who established a new vineyard. The religious leaders who were listening would surely have thought of the landowner in Isaiah, the one we heard about this morning in the first lesson. Jesus uses almost the same words to describe how the landowner set up, set up his own vineyard. In Isaiah, we soon realize that the landowner is God. So probably they imagine that this landowner is supposed to represent God too. We are likely to do the same because we have been hearing all these stories from Matthew about the vineyard that is the kingdom of God. But then in Jesus' story, the landowner goes away and leases the vineyard. So now the story is moving away from the one in Isaiah with this new twist, an absentee owner. Where do you find yourself in this story? That depends on what you think of landowners and tenants and what they owe each other. So now it is harvest time. And as expected, the absentee landowner sends slaves to collect his share of the annual produce. This was expected, but now the story takes another twist. The tenants do not turn over the landowner's share of produce. They refuse. In fact, they, act, they, they viciously attack the slaves, beating one, killing one, and stoning another. So much for identifying with the tenants. This murderous vi violence is too much, even if the landowner has been unfair. At this point, my sympathies are with the slaves, even more so as the landowner sends more of them into his blood-soaked vineyard. And what choice do they have about it? Is that not the way of the world, that the people at the bottom pay the price for other people's messes? But the parable takes yet another turn. Now the landowner sends his own son, his own son, sent to, into this violent and troubled place where he too is rejected and killed. 
Then we remember whose story this is. Jesus is telling the story, God's story, the story of the kingdom. Jesus is in the temple, arguing with the religious leaders. It is Holy Monday in Jerusalem. The day before, mobs of wildly cheering people welcomed him with homes. On Friday, he will be nailed to the cross. So we are those tenants after all. We are the ones who have forgotten who we are. We are the workers in this vineyard, not owners. But listen to us. Do we not sound like owners and act like owners? We talk about our money, our time, our church, like we own any of those things. When you think you are a owner, you put a fence around what is yours and do what you have to do to protect it. We are those tenants, the ones who reject God's prophets from age to age. We are the ones who ruin God's fruitful vineyard with waste, neglect, greed, and violence. But the good news is that God does not give up on us. Jesus does not end this parable in judgment. God is willing to find new tenants for the vineyard. And God keeps calling us into the vineyard, inviting us to join his own work. If we will not do it, then his vineyard will go to others. For God's work will be done. God's kingdom will come. It is October, the time of the harvest. God keeps coming to us in this vineyard, looking for signs of love and mercy, the fruits of the kingdom. He comes to us this day and every Sunday in the bread and wine as God's own life offered for you and for me. We can begin today with a clean slate. What kind of steward do you intend to be? A greedy, stingy one who seeks out your own satisfaction? Or a joyous one who returns what belongs to the owner in order that others may share in the joy? I can only answer for the vineyard God has given to me. You will have to answer for your own vineyard. I intend to start again to honor God, to return to God what has been entrusted to me. What will you do in the vineyard that God has given to you? My hope and prayer for you is that in this harvest season, you will join with me to celebrate the fruits of our labor in our Lord's vineyard. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>